Hello, everybody. Welcome. This is episode two of ZK Live. What's up, buddy? What's going on? How are you? Uh, I'm all right. Just laying low, resting up the week. Got that job to wrap up, so we do. There and do it. I appreciate you coming on on uh, late notice. Yeah, I I wasn't doing anything other than just laying around the house, hanging out with the kids and the wife. That's why I'm, I, I like the idea of doing Sunday nights, too, because it's, you know, you're chilled. Everyone's just ready to kind of calm down and think about next week. And if we can make this show twice a week, we're going to try to do Fridays and Sundays, but we might do like a Wednesday and Sundays. Um, you know, it's the beauty of starting a show. You, you can kind of do whatever you want. But I think this Sunday thing is nice because, yeah, it's like, oh, like a little calmer. Just getting yeah, ready was, for next week. Yeah, I was organizing my car and doing laundry, getting my whites together and getting ready to shave and take a shower. And and then you called. So, yeah, I figured I'd jump on with you. Wonderful. So why don't you start by, well, I think that's how we're going to do it with everybody. Tell us your story. How did you end up here? How did I end up painting? Yeah, painting in general. And then we can get to uh, ZK after. Um. Well, I, I grew up around tradesmen. My, my grandfather and all my uncles on both sides of the family are uh, bricklayers. Some were in the union, some own their own businesses. So as a kid, every male around me, except for my father, got up every morning, put on work boots, and came home filthy. And it was just, it's all that I knew. Um, and... I, I know how to lay brick. I know how to mix mortar. I know how to do all that stuff. So I did a lot of that when I was a kid uh, during the summer with my grandfather and stuff. And then um, about my teenage years, I was getting in a lot of trouble in the city. And my dad started taking me painting with him on the weekends. He worked for uh, trucking companies in the office. So he'd do like repaints in the offices. So I'd go there and roll out a couple walls and rummage through some drawers and <laughs> you know just just raise hell and it got to the point where it was time for high school and my father we had a vocational high school in the city and we had a regular high school and he sat me down and he said well you go to vocational high school you go to work you go to regular high school you go to college and I was like well I was never really that good in school so I was like well let's go to vocational high school and and get it over with so I originally went to vocational high school to be a chef, culinary arts. Wow. I used to do a lot of cooking with my mother and my grandmother. And we went through an exploratory program. There was four shops that we went through. I think I went through culinary arts, heating and ventilation, graphic arts, which was like a lot of printing. And I went through painting and decorating. And I think the first two days in there, I did like some screen printing and some sign painting. And I was just like, yeah, this is for me. And the rest is history. I went, I was the only boy in the shop for four years. So I got razzed a lot and, and bullied, but look at me now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's, that's how I got into painting as a trade. And then my father passed away and things got tough about a year after high school so I worked for a college pro for about a month and I said this is insane this isn't how it works and I packed my bags and I moved about half hour from Boston and at the time there was no Craigslist or anything it was all classified so I called the company and they pretty much hired me on the spot and I've just been on the move ever since there's a lot to be said for uh, like see, like being. A, I have a similar story. I was around a strong work ethic and working with your hands at a young age, um, and I think it it did definitely instill like this is just the way you do it. That like my dad was always doing stuff and everyone was just doing stuff, yeah. and and I can see like that was definitely helped me get in here and and produce work and be motivated to keep moving because that that's what everyone did and you know it just sort of I remember being a little kid. And just like want to keep up, you know, he just wanted to keep up with everybody. Yeah. And I think that is so valuable to, to try to work harder and harder and harder to try to keep up with the big guys. Um, you know, I feel like I'm still doing that every day. 
Yeah, I remember my my uncles. They used to take the the brick tongs. There, uh, you can carry like twelve bricks at a time, eight eighteen bricks at a time, and they would shrink them down to like four or five bricks. And I'd have one in each hand, trying to drag it across the yard and tripping over myself. And I mean, I graduated high school. I was like five four and weighed like ninety pounds. You know, I'm not a big guy at all. So I've always had to dig deeper to be able to get stuff like that done. Um, yeah. Even even once I started painting, I didn't always paint. I did a lot of carpentry. I mean, I'm a frame to finish carpenter too. Um, and that's a pretty rugged business. So trying to lift staging planks and set up holes for pump jacks and getting shingles on the roof. I mean, my strength always had to come from within rather than the exterior, you know? So I think being around tradesmen just taught me a lot of a lot of grit and how to just dig in and just get it done and it'll be over the the sooner you get it done <laughs> yeah and, and I, it's like the good and bad side of of working with your hands you know i, I think it's incredibly rewarding yeah. to do what we do right i feel bad often for people who sit in front of a computer all day and when they finish the day you may have worked very hard but sometimes it, it i can imagine it feeling like well, what did i actually accomplish uh, at least biologically, the the brain probably struggles with that. But when we can look at a wall and say, like, oh, I did that and it's done, um, there's a lot to be said for that. And and moving with the body and, and time flies when you when you go to work and you're cutting and rolling. And, and it's like the days fly by, um, at least for me and, and I'm sure for most people in the trades. Um, yeah, it does, does for me, too. I mean, after the... the three week break from the whole COVID thing. Uh, we went and sprayed that kitchen and I told you like two days later, I was sore from, <laughs> from all the yep. squatting and the up and down from, from spraying all that primer. Like I was really sore. I felt like I got hit by a bus, <laughs> but yeah, it felt good. I'm a sucker for punishment, I guess. Well, I think, I think our biology wants that though. Like, yeah as a human like we our biology wants to be stressed recover stress recover you know we go to the gym and simulate this stuff because we don't have enough of it in our lives sometimes so there's definitely like a if you can work safely and ergonomically and all those things doing what we do is i think is great for the the mind and the body oh, um totally. and i'm definitely grateful for you know being in it mm -hmm. me too and the vocational schools, like you talked about, like, man, I didn't, I didn't have that. That's not my experience exactly. But, you know, there's definitely a big lack of that today. Um, and I think we're seeing it in these young people. Um, I mean, we've brought on enough young people. Um, it's tough to find the young kids who have that motor and sort of have any base skill. If you didn't grow up with your parents doing this stuff or, your, you know, your family members, it's tough to take a kid and bring them into the shop or on a job site and tell them like, here, here's some like hundred grit sandpaper, sand, hand sand all the trim all day long today. For like, three weeks. For three <laughs> weeks. Like that's tough. That yeah, is no, tough. It's, it's not easy. I mean, when we, when we hired on our current apprentices, I felt it was middle of June and July, we were in that room, we were sanding those black doors, and I put them on the detail sanding. And I think we were there for two weeks straight sanding those 40 some doors. And I felt really, really bad, but it just had to be done, you know. And yeah, the, the three of them stuck it out, which meant they wanted to be there. So that was that was great. And I, I think that's important, right? You have to pay your dues. We oh, did have, when I grew up, like growing up, like that's what we had to do, right? You're, you're the, you're the young kid, like you're just going to do the crappy work and yep. no one wants to hear you complain. No. That's how I grew up today. You know, you, you have to be, we have to be softer to our apprentices, but we still, they still need to pay their dues. They need to earn it. They need to be able to do everything and have said like, Oh, I've caulked till my fingers were bloody enough times, right? I've sanded till my fingertips were bloody enough times. Like I've done that so much that now I can run a job site. I'll still do it too. But if you know, you don't get to just skip to spraying out gloss rooms and doing no prep. No. 
and you know, I think that's a thing we definitely run into with some of these younger kids um, is wanting to go so fast and not really pay the dues, you know, do the crappy work, stay humble, put your head down. You know, those are things that we need from our team. And I think we're lucky that we have, we found some, but we've also had to let some people go because they just didn't rise to the occasion. Um, yeah. It was, it's, it's tough. It's tough for me. I, I come from, I come from the old school ways, you know, I mean, I had, I had an uncle who would throw two by fours at me if I cut them short when we were framing houses and I've been hollered and screamed at, and I've had old guys want to fight me on the job site and everything else. And we don't exist in that world today. And I surely don't behave like that. But sometimes I have to admit, I do, I do expect more out of my apprentices than, than they could probably actually put out, you know, and, it's good and bad because I'm, I'm pushing them beyond their limits, but at the same time, not everybody reacts well to that pressure either. Especially. Yeah. And we've had, we've had this conversation extensively and just because we were traumatized as young <laughs> workers doesn't mean we should be re we should be passing the trauma down. No, no, no. And it's <laughs> you know. something I, it, I, it's a, a skill set that I still work every single day from seven thirty to four. Um, I'm constantly yeah. reevaluating it and trying to fix it and, and, and make it better. And so far, so good. I mean, Hollis, Hollis has been my wingman, and he's stuck it out with me with no complaints. So I think, I think I'm getting there. Yeah, <laughs> I, I've I've watched the growth, and you know, you're gonna get a new apprentice soon. Just so you know, you know, because because we have to. We have too much work, and we have to bring new people in. So more young people are going to get in, keep coming into the, this company. And I think it, we've had a lot of discussions back and forth trying to figure out how do we how do we take these young people and make them productive painters and and also understand that they're coming from a different world than, you know, we came from. And that's that's not a bad thing. It's it's a reality and and definitely learning to be softer and you know, understanding and, and helping to build these people um, because there's just such a lack of young people in the trades. And it's because I think a lot of guys are going, well, the way I did it, I, the way I grew up is the way I'm going to like treat young people today. And it's like, no, man, you, you have to understand that these are different people and they're not wrong to say, like, don't scream at me and throw things at me. Like, yeah, that's not wrong. I've I've, I've never done that, but I've, I've experienced, I mean, I, I think the era that I come from tradesmen were Neanderthals and it's all that they could do. You know, they were, they weren't people that weren't really allowed in offices or anything like that. So it was, it was on job sites, you know, and I've gotten past that level of building. And now I'm at this level where everybody that I'm around is a craftsman and, and a, a really high quality human being in general. Yeah, and, and that's that's the beauty of what we're doing is, you know, we get to be selective. And But I think, I, I, I know I talk to a lot of business owners that are struggling to find um, help and young people. And, you know, I, I think we have decided to change ourselves rather than to try to change them as much. And Nick Slavic is a big influencer uh, in my thinking on that, you know, he's had a lot of success doing it. And it's like, yeah, what am I going to, I've had, I have a buddy, I know a couple people who told me, I'm just going to go out of business when my older people retire. Cause I don't want to change. Okay. That's fine. But I don't want to do that. So it's, it's been an, an, an interesting ride trying to figure out how do we change ourselves and how do we build a company where young people can come in here with some hunger and some fire and be molded into these craftsmen or craftspeople that produce work and have the, the grit, like you said, to actually get stuff done. Um, and enjoy it. And, and yeah, not, and, and feel not, proud not, at the end of the day. Yeah, not grind their soul into dust trying, yeah. to, trying to do it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 that's, it's definitely, I think, a challenge that a lot of people have right now. Um, and when you think about it, like, why is someone going to want to come work for us? Like, why are they going to want to come painting? 
you know, we need to make it attractive. And because it, I think it is an attractive thing, but we need to sell it to them. And then we need to make it a positive environment when they come. So it's definitely been, you know, a work in progress, but I think we're doing really well. Um, I'm, I'm happy about the direction that it's going. And I, like I told you, I think we're ready for another apprentice because Hollis is coming up on a year with me and he's pretty much an extension of myself now to a certain point with certain basic skill sets where he can help me oversee the apprentice and get him going on or her going on nitro and caulking and sanding and all that stuff. Um, and then we can get him on a spray gun and, and, and bringing his skill set up on, on the second year of his apprenticeship. Yeah. I, I just noticed somebody mentioned, uh, they said something that was actually my story as well that they worked with their dad and they prepped and sanded and caulked and painted walls, but never sprayed until I was on my own. Um, I had that same story. I never sprayed for, I worked for a couple other painters after the little stint I did with my dad. And even then I was never allowed to touch a sprayer. Um, and I don't think that makes sense. Like, no, it don't, it doesn't. you know, we're asking guys to sand for three weeks straight with their fingers like raw. And then they don't get the, the payoff at the end of spraying the primer. You know, and we we do that in our company, which is awesome. You know, everyone in the company has sprayed early, early on. You know, you can spray a fast dry primer. We can walk you through how to do it with a cup gun. And you're not going to create too much extra work if you mess up. And it's a great way to get people excited and, and also build skill. Yep. Uh, but that idea that, like, spraying is this, like, sacred thing that you have to, like, reach four levels and make three sacrifices to get to why why <laughs> yeah no I, I think hollis hollis is ready on the next kitchen to to do all the priming yeah and i'll sit back and i'll film him for once <laughs> and and josh is getting ready to do the same thing in the shop with dan yeah. he's spraying i mean he sprayed a whole kitchen uh set the other day by himself no one was here he came in on a friday and sprayed been on all those cabinets un, unsupervised and did an amazing job he, because we've trained him up until now because he's he's worked extensively on the side of somebody and he's seen it from front to back seen the guns mess up seen all the issues with it he's sanded all the issues out he knows what orange peel is so now it's time to now they understand what's going on when it's coming out of the gun and i think they'll just excel yeah and it's just right. It just helps. You got to give some, you got to give people some fun mixed in with all of the, the paying their dues. If you never have any fun, what the heck are we doing? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, man, that kitchen down there is looking pretty good. I was down there the other day on Friday delivering paint. Um, and it's awesome. The, one of the, the client's daughter actually reached out through Instagram and was like, that's my parents' kitchen. It looks so good. I'm so happy that you guys are documenting the process. So this whole Instagram thing, we, and we can get into how we met, right? It, it's, it's Instagram has just yeah. been so powerful. Yeah, it has been. It's been, it's been very powerful. So tell us more. So, so you were painting. Um, you continue your story. I, I, I have a tendency to cut people off. I'm well, sorry. Uh, I don't know that that was I worked for two painting companies out of high school about a year each and then I started doing carpentry and construction and they found out I could paint so they brought me on as a, the company painter so outside of working for you I've only worked for two or three painting companies in my entire 20 plus year career other than that it's always been as a company painter for a general contractor or a custom home builder. And it's as far as tarring foundations when they pull the forms all the way up to painting the cupola, um, back priming all the trim in the house. Um, I worked for a company where we would polyurethane all the floors before they were even laid. That way they were sealed and protected against spills and everything. And then when the house was done, they'd come back in and sand them and I'd, I'd repolish them. Um, but in the meantime, I, 
I struggled for a long time with uh, depression and social anxiety. So when a depressive episode would hit, I'd fall off the face of the planet for two weeks and I'd lose my job. So then I'd have to find another one and another one and another one. And that went on for a good 10 or 12 years until I really figured myself out and got a grasp on it. So I went through a lot of companies. I went through a lot of changes and struggles and everything. Um, I've worked for my uncle a couple times. He hired and fired me more than I could possibly imagine. Um, and that's how I got to know job sites so well and how to read people and feel the climate in the air of what's going on with the, the clients and my boss and my coworkers and everything. Um, I have really good feelers for that now because I was always on, on high alert. Um, and then I settled into a really good company, a really good custom builder here in, in Rhode Island. And God, six years I've been working in an area the size of, size of a postage stamp, doing remodels and custom homes as the company painter again. And when work would dry up, I'd, uh, I'd install windows during the, the winter forum or, or whatever. And that's when I had a heart condition and I was, I was, had an Instagram, but I wasn't serious about it. And I swore once I made it through the surgery that I would start taking my craft a lot more seriously and I'd start documenting my work and I'd, I'd get out there and, and do it. So I recovered, I got back to work. I think I painted a kitchen or two and I was on Instagram in my Explorer and I seen you working on a high gloss wine room. And I remember that job. I instantly messaged you and asked you if you were hiring and I gave you my whole rundown. Um, and I said that I wanted to come in for a working interview and I wanted to check out that door and see what was going on and you agreed and the rest is history. I mean, I, I was there the last coat of that high gloss wine room and I remember standing in the middle of it going, I've never seen so much wet high gloss oil paint all around me in my whole entire life. And this is a challenge that I need to, to conquer. This is a dragon that I need to slay. Um, and here we are now. And there are plenty of days where you wish you never, you never said that. You know, sometimes with the two hour commutes, I miss my 15 minute ride down to the ocean, but uh, in the end, it's all worth it. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been awesome watching you grow and, be challenged again right like yeah that, that was the thing i wasn't challenged everything it felt like groundhog day the movie i mean everything started to be the same old same old you know same old products um it was a different house but it was the same patch job or the same trim on the same floor that needed to be polyurethane and this was definitely definitely injected life back into me and yeah, because you, feel, you definitely don't get that again. here. I mean, <laughs> I mean, the Boston job, the the bathroom in Providence. I mean, these are all really great projects that I've been training my whole life to to lead on and absolutely crush. So it's been it's been really awesome. I glad I'm glad when I was laying in the hospital after my operation that something went off in my head and said this is kind of like a second chance on life, and you better get out there and and get after it. And after a year of working with you, I, I reflected on it, and it was a smart choice. And I'm, I'm happy that it's it's going the way that it is. Yeah. There's ne never a dull moment here, right? No. You have to put up with me <laughs> coming in. Hey, guys, we're going to do this new thing. We're going to do this today. Hey, I got this new job. We're going to do this over here. It's going to be nuts. <laughs> I I feel sorry for you guys because that's – that. <laughs> if you guys don't know, that's – that's what it's like to work for me is yeah. I'll come in and just like, ah, like we got this new thing. We're going to do this thing. It's going to be so cool. And then it's like, and we'll figure out how to do it. You know, I'm, I'm three quarters of the way through the newest cool project and product and testing. And we have a conversation at lunchtime that he just sold two more totally opposite jobs that are going to be even cooler than this one. And probably even further away than this one. Yeah. Um, but 
in order to do this kind of work, you have to step way outside your comfort comfort zone, and you have to have that grit, and you have to you have to want the challenge. I mean, yeah. I left a fifteen minute commute to to do all this stuff um, and and deepen my skill set, and that was pretty much my goal with with getting. I wanted to get back into oil because that's what I I grew up painting, and boy did I. <laughs> yeah yep <laughs> absolutely but it's a beautiful thing yeah awesome all right so we're gonna do we're every every week we're gonna do the, the three sort of bits that we're always gonna do and then we'll we'll answer some questions but um what's your, let's start with what's your favorite piece of paint paraphernalia it could be a paint it could be a tool it can be an app. It can be anything. Uh, my favorite would have to be the good old trusty five in one. Um, I, one of the first companies I worked for, the guy gave me one when I was trying to open a can with like a quarter or something. And he's like, no, kid, that's not how we do it. We use these. And he handed me one. And I've had one on me every day since. I can't remember the last time I opened a can with a can opener. Um, it's great for masking, cleaning out rollers, um, you name it. Um, so my favorite one is the custom one that I had made. If you didn't say five and one was your favorite piece, I was going to be shocked because I know that you own this piece. <laughs> so my custom Damascus five and one made by guys here in Massachusetts, Morel Metalsmiths. It's a work of art and I've used it. It's got paint on it. It was pretty pricey, but... I couldn't let it just sit and not be used. So that that's my favorite tool out of out of everything is a five in one. And it's an essential tool for every painter. It's it's near my car keys. When I wake up in the morning and go to work, car keys go in one pocket, five in one goes in the other. And at the end of the day when I get home it comes out and it gets put in my little my little caddy with my keys. It's always with me no matter what. It never gets put down. See, I, I've, I've lost far too many five-in-ones in my career to have ever invested in such a nice five-in-one like you did. Um, I, have, I always had a tendency to lose them. But they're, they're incredibly valuable tools. They are. It's, it's, it's the first thing I handed to all our apprentices when they started. I went out and bought them ones. And I said, this is your tool. I want it with you every single day. You're going to use it more than you could ever possibly imagine. Take good care of it. Don't don't let the little corner get all like nibbed and like sharp yeah, and yeah, off to one side. I yeah, don't price sta ridiculous staples with it. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Mickey just asked, is there a massive difference between fine paints of Europe compared to America's best oil? Um, I would say that yes, there is um Amer like there's not really domestically made high quality oil based paint um anymore. Um, the, the, the Holland lac that we use is that's an exterior grade Marine finish that we all, we put inside quite often. Um, the oil that is made domestically is I can think of satin and purvo, which is an interior trim paint that was remade, um, not too long ago. And it's not the same thing it used to be 10 years ago. Even, um, yeah, even, I mean, I think it's more like 15 years now. I mean, that stuff, it was, an, it's legendary. It was an incredible yeah. paint. And they, the government, with all the VOC laws and everything, it got stepped on. And now yeah. it's, it's not even close to what it was. And you would never, you would never put it outside. And the same is true with uh, Sherwin-Williams. Um, they have an oil, pro-classic oil. Uh, but again, it, it, you don't put it outside. And I don't think either company makes an oil exterior finish anymore. F finished paint. Uh -huh. Uh, no, it's as far not, as I know, it's all labeled as uh, like metal to, to beat the yeah. VOC laws. I think it's all uh, like metal paint. Like that's how they have to label it. Yeah. So to answer your question, there, there's nothing. There's not a comparable product. Um, as much as my reps here have tried and tried, there's not a comparable product that I'm aware of that's made domestically. Um, that that's can be used the way Hall and Lack Brilliant is used. I, I've yet to really try that Kirby paint that's made locally 
that is a seventh generation company. Um, and it was created in uh, New Bedford, which is a whaling, it's an old whaling town. And I believe the paint was originally created for all the boats and everything. And so I'm definitely paint. looking to have uh, a paint chemist or two come on, you know, for on this show. Um, so I, I really, cause I really do want to go deep into the chemistry of what's in a gallon of paint to help people understand the differences. Um, we have, I have not sprayed a front door with automotive paint. I know people that have, um, I th the, the argument is that those paints dry, they're, they're meant for metal and they don't flex very well. So, but you know, I, I've heard people make arguments against that as well. If you're not using a FP. Lot, a lot of the car companies are using water-based car paints now. I have a buddy who does auto body who works at a dealership and it's all, it's all water-based now. It's not, uh, it's not like the good old, the good old days. Yeah. Those, those paints are, are intense. And from what I understand, they're meant for metal and metal is not going to expand and contract the way wood does. Um, so the one part oil enamel is going to be more flexible and it is meant for, um, wood and the automotive paints are not meant to be on wood that's the main reason why i have not gone there also i they're not that it matters that's not what we care about but they're also much more expensive if i had to spray out of a turbine what finish would we use um clears <laughs> what's that clears Anything yeah cl clear clear coats uh the best caulking um <laughs> is tower tech 2 is the is a premium sealant. Uh, it's got like an 800% flex rate. There's not, I believe it's it's as good of a of a sealant or caulking that you can, as you can buy. Tower Tech too. Um, it's not super easy to manipulate. It's still that's what for a water based. It's the best, um, but it's still it's not it's not going to flow out like a Shermax or something would. Well, um, that's, that's the thing with any of these high quality products that don't have fillers in them like uh the fine paints and everything there's a learning curve and they're not designed for ease of use they're designed to work and be very so it's in it's in the craftsperson's hands to have the skill set to, to make it all look right and apply it right and and figure out the tricks with it yeah i would That's encourage awesome. everyone to try some tower tech too um that's that's the best caulking that I've and it's not called a caulking it's called a sealant um, a very knowledgeable man that we'll have on here Jay Woodslack is a he's a paint I don't know if he's a chemist but he's a, he's a rep for industrial paint for Sherwin Williams a guy I met here through Instagram very knowledgeable and and he turned me on to Tower Tech too um, and when you look at the specs on that product um, the flex and the I mean and then when you use it you can just tell it's a different thing it's a different um, beast all the and that's one of those things that we always tell everyone, like, stop buying cheap caulking. You know, it's, it's a few dollars a tube, and it could cost you thousands on water damage later. Um, and the, so. the other tip that I have for caulking is don't bury it under three coats of primer and two coats of finish. You've got to keep it up at the surface so that those layers of paint don't stiffen on top of it and not allow it to do its job without it cracking. And you need to have enough caulking there that it actually can flex. If you yeah. put too thin of a bead, there's not enough caulking there to actually move. Yeah, and it'll just pop and it'll look terrible. Yeah. Look terrible is, is the, the best thing it'll be. It, it, the water damage is- Well, yeah, on, on, yeah. on exterior. On an exterior. Yeah, on exterior, it's, it's more about actually working than it is for looks. It's not like interior. Yeah. <clears throat> And so we, I used to use uh, Big Stretch, which is another great premium caulking. Um, the problem with Big Stretch for us is it requires seven days before you put oil-based paint on it. And we use a lot of oil-based paint. So we really have moved away from Big Stretch just because, you know, it, it doesn't work for a lot of our projects. It's a great product, though. I used it for a long time. It is. Just it, like, it's like anything. 
you get what you pay for. Like when buying caulking, find the most expensive one you can find. Generally, you know, you're going to do all right. Same with primers, same with paints, you know, go find the most expensive one. Cause the labor is the expensive part of what we do. There's no question. Yeah. Fixing all that stuff because it failed is what gets expensive. In the long run. Yeah. Uh, Corona. I'm a, I'm a Corona brush guy, but I think, but everyone, every, like I know people, Jessica Allred will be on and she'll tell you she uses a $2 brush. I can't tell you where it's from and anything about it. She can decide if she wants to, but she rolls and tips with a $2 brush that you would laugh at. And she probably the best brush applicator of oil enamel I know. So I think the brush, well, I, what I will say, and you know, sorry, John and everyone at FPE, I don't believe that the brushes that fine paint sells are the best brushes for oil anymore. They were up until whatever, 10, 15 years ago. I don't think, unless you're going for what we would call a traditional brushed finish, which, which is a look, right? Those like very defined brush strokes. Some clients want that. That's when I'm going to use the FPE brush. Um, Br brushing oil, it's not about the brush. It's about the way that you apply it. And you can apply it. You got to flow it on. And you can do that with almost any brush. So yeah, it's not so much about the, the makeup of the bristles or the quality of the brush when it comes to brushing oil. I mean, of course, you don't want bristles falling out, but it's, it's the application of oil. It's when you get to the latexes and everything else that a good brush makes all the difference in the world. The, the nice thing about the FPE brushes are they're short. So with oil, if you're just brushing it on, you're not r rolling it and then tipping it. If you're just brushing it on, you do want a stiffer brush because oil needs to be worked. It is the absolute opposite of water-based paint. You need to work and work and work and work and work it, spread it out, spread, keep spreading, keep spreading, keep spreading. Water-based paint, you want to like two brush strokes and be done and let it set. Um, so they're very different paint applications. Uh, we'll have to make some videos about the difference in brushing water-based and oil-based paint. Um, how do you go about picking a new thing to offer your client? For example, if you're just interior and you want to do cabinet painting. In my experience, we, I find clients that have the projects I want to do and I do whatever it takes to get that project the first time. G generally, that means giving them amazing pricing. Um, and then once you've done it, now you can go sell it for, and you'll know what it costs and you'll be able to go sell it for what it costs. And you'll have a, a, a piece of work you can point to and say, I did this. Um, the perfect example is the metal wall that we're going to be doing. Uh, I would imagine we will charge three times what we charge for that wall on the next wall. But I was very excited to do some Vero metal. And so I was not looking to be profitable on this job. You know, you pay to go to college. I'll take one on the chin to get some experience doing a cool project and getting it in my portfolio. So I would, I would encourage people that want to do new stuff like, like the gloss doors. Like I did my first gloss door for like, I don't know, 600 bucks. Something like that. Very much less than what we charge today. Just gave it away. <laughs> Just gave it away. Like, hey, please let me do this. You know, and I was so happy to have that door. And it led to the next door and led to the next door. You know, but it's all a long game. New, new processes can't be all that profitable. Yeah. All right. We need a war story. We're running out of time. A war story. Um, it's not a painting one, but. Uh, it's all right. Uh, it, it was the middle of winter. I got sent to Home Depot. I, I was doing construction at the time. We were doing decks. And I, I had to pick up some pressure treated. And it was outside. Um, and it was soaking wet, but it was frozen. Well, it was going to freeze that night, but it was soaking wet. So I got up on the van. And I got back to the shop. And I parked it for the night. And we come in the next morning. And the old guy that I was working with, he was really irritable. He got something at his house, so we had to go down his dirt driveway, and he was flying down it because we were going to be late. And as we're driving, I keep seeing the boards moving more and more and more, hanging over the windshield. Um, and I'm just, like, watching it, and I'm keeping my mouth shut. I didn't say nothing to him because he would have, like, flipped out on me. 
So we get out on the highway out here. It's called 88. It goes all the way down to the beach. It's, it's a one lane highway each way. And he's flying up to a red light and he slams on the brakes. And all of a sudden I just see one frozen pressure treated board slip out of the middle of the pile and into the middle of the intersection. And I was like, oh man. And as soon as the van like stopped, everything on the roof ended up in the middle of the four way intersection. And the high school was just around the corner and all the buses were coming from every direction. And there was just 16 foot two by fours and two by sixes and two by eights all over the intersection in the middle of winter. Um, that is probably my most horrific war story of of doing construction and painting and stuff. Well, and, uh, I can say that I've had that happen to me twice. So I got hollered and screamed at like you wouldn't believe. But I, I blamed <laughs> it on the old man for flying down his driveway and he he wanted to murder me. <laughs> I, once that happens, you definitely sh strap things down a little bit better going forward. Needless to say, I didn't have to do the lumber runs anymore. And they put me back on a brush. <laughs> I, I bet. All right. Now we need a, a DIY pro tip if for homeowners or non-painters. Uh, what is something that you would – a tip or a trick that you would want people to know? Um, tip or trick? God, I have so many. Um, all right. Let's take the one from my video the other day with the putty knife. If you have a really flexible putty knife and it's really thin, whenever you caulk something that comes down vertically to the floor, whether it be on the side of the baseboard, um, baseboard heat, the, the corners where baseboard meets, trim and doorways where they come to the floor, if you slip your putty knife under there, bring the caulking down to it, wipe it all out as best you can, Pull your putty knife out and then swipe up and you can clean that nice little edge so it looks really sharp and really crisp and it looks like you were never there and you never caulked it. And it also doesn't fill the gap. So when we pull all the paper and tape and everything, you have that nice clean line that goes all the way around the bottom of the room and you don't have any interruptions from caulking and get it underneath and not being able to get it out. And that's that, the nice that is the most advanced DIY tip that we'll probably ever have on this show. <laughs> I, I'll just, I'll end with one <laughs> that's more DIY. <laughs> How about don't paint out of the can? Yeah, don't paint out of the can. Everyone in the world, please stop painting out of the can. It's so what, painful to watch, especially the full can. Let me add that too, because what I was taught, only put as much in the can that you're gonna use in that particular day or before your next break or a lunch period or whatever. That way, if you do have a spill, you're cleaning up a quart of paint and you're not cleaning up a half gallon and you're not getting all the paint up into the ferrule of your brush. So that's a good one. Yeah, don't yeah. work out of a gallon. Get a paint. Oh, I feel, you watch homeowners, and it, it, it's so painful to see someone painting out of a full gallon because you know how, that's so hard. That's hard for us to do. I would never want to do that. No, that makes nice. the job so much more difficult. That's a day ruiner. Yeah, day. man. Stop painting out of full gallons, everybody. And oh, and the other thing I saw the other day is people poking holes in the rim of the can so that when they do pour it, it drains. Don't do that. Because if you don't poke the holes at the right angle, everybody says that it seals and it really doesn't. If you're on if you're on the outer edge of it, it never seals completely, and when you come back to that paint in a couple months, especially for do-it-yourselfers, your polyurethane, your latex, it's going to skin over, and just get a wet rag. Wipe it out with your brush, clean the room with a wet rag, and seal it back up. Don't poke holes in it. Don't make it look like Swiss cheese. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, Phil, thank you for coming on on, on late notice. No um, problem. I appreciate it. And uh, let's rock and roll tomorrow morning on the kitchen job. Yeah, party time. Awesome. Thanks, buddy. Thank you. All right. We're going to wrap up now. I appreciate everyone being here. Uh, this is a 
a fun experiment we're going to get better and better at each week. Um, we won't have that microphone mix up that we had to start. Um, but if you like this, if you like this and, and it was enjoyable, you got anything out of it, I would really love it if you would like and share this. Um, we're going to be posting this on IGTV right after. Um, next week, next Friday at 6 p.m., I am very excited for you to all meet Jessica Allred from Alternative Finishes. She's one of the best painters I've ever met, probably the most conscientious um, and the painter with the least ego that I've ever seen in the painting business. She is a master painter and is just so thoughtful, so knowledgeable. She's going to blow everyone away on Friday. I couldn't be more excited for you guys all to get to know Jessica a little bit. Uh, I was very intimidated when I first met Jessica. I, I, I'd like seen her talk a couple of years in a row. And then uh, the third year I got to sit next to her at dinner and I was like, so nervous to talk to her and she's she's amazing i'm lucky to call her a friend uh so please everyone like share this and tune in next friday at 6 p.m thanks guys